Welcome to Sisters Inc., our podcast for and about women business owners, brought to you by Black Enterprise. I'm your host, Elisa Gums. Black women are the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs in America. And on every episode of Sisters Inc., we'll sit down with one successful CEO and share how she slays the challenges of being a black woman in business. Today's episode is all about building a sustainable business. We're chatting with Robin Wilson, the creative director of Robin Wilson Home. She's an eco designer who has sold millions of dollars of licensed sustainable and hypoallergenic home goods through retail, wholesale, and B2B. And next month, she's launching a new line at Macy's. Welcome to Sisters Inc., Robin, and thanks so much for sitting down with us. Thank you so much for having me. Black Enterprise has been covering you for years, but this is the first time that I've had the pleasure of interviewing you. So I want to start at the beginning. Where did your passion for interior design and home decor come from? You know, we all have the origin story. And I think about my grandmother, who in the era of The Help, if we remember the movie The Help, she was a housekeeper, but she was more than a housekeeper. She could have been a couturier. She could sew dresses. She could sew curtains. She could sew quilts. She was an amazing designer. But unfortunately, her title was housekeeper. And her wonderful talent was unrealized in the public domain. I also think about my grandfather on my paternal side, who was a sharecropper. He picked cotton and... Now my products are going to be sold at Macy's and internationally, and they're made of cotton. I think of all of our ancestors who have worked so very hard to allow us to believe that we had the right and the moxie to move forward and to chase our entrepreneurial dreams. And so I pay homage to all of those folks, but I also got from those folks allergies and asthma (laughs) genetically. And so when you think about that growing up wheezing and sneezing, it was really important for me to use some of the things I learned from my parents, uh, the pediatrician they selected for me, uh, who was a hippie doctor in Austin, Texas. And his philosophy was raise a strong child, not a child on strong medicine and make sure that the environment in which they live is healthy and non-toxic. So that's where the inspiration comes from. And I'm so grateful, um, as you know, Malcolm Gladwell writes about the tipping point, the 10,000 hours to be an expert. So my 10,000 hours of wheezing and sneezing and carrying the backpack with Kleenex, I think I'm pretty prepared to share with people some of the simple tips they can use to live well. As, as a fellow asthmatic and allergy sufferer, I feel you on that all the way. And I'm like, you are clearly smarter than me because why did I not think to use my 10,000 hours of wheezing for something good? <laughs> clearly, you have a personal um, connection to the space, personal experience with the space. Um, but how did you decide to settle on sustainability as your specialization in business? Like, was there ever any other plan? Well, you know, thank you. That is a fantastic question. You know, I came out of college, um, well, while I was in college, I worked for a hydroelectric utility in Austin, Texas. And I learned about the difference between coal-fired plants, hydro plants, um, I call it the not in my backyard. You know, nobody wants a power plant built in their backyard, but nobody thinks about conserving energy. So you don't need the next power plant. Um, and so I learned about that, that I, you know, ideology. I then went to work for a consulting firm um, in Boston and worked on their energy conservation group and learned again about the global pull that we have to just use energy, never thinking that gosh, you know, when you're brushing your teeth in the morning, turn off the water. Or, you know, if you leave the room, really turn off your light. Yes, it makes no difference in your electric bill, but it does make a difference in the power that we use. Um, If you can use solar, use solar. All those things were in the background. But then I had the fortunate moment of 
working for a company that did an IPO in 1999. And I remember sitting there and let's say Monday you had a number and Tuesday you had zeros behind that number. And I'm from such humble backgrounds. My parents, when I said, what's an I- IPO? What, what, why am I signing all these papers? They're like, well, maybe you're going to get a new um, HMO plan. <laughs> So my family was no help. So I remember learning about IPOs. So I then went to a mentor and I said, what do I do? I have all this money. They said, what is your passion? What would you do if you had no money coming in, but you could live the same lifestyle? I said, I do something in real estate. My family has land and, you know, real estate holdings for, you know, from generations ago, Um, little, I call them shotgun shacks, little houses that um, you rented to oil fill workers outside of Houston. And he said, if you love real estate, you need a master's in real estate finance. And this mentor happened to have enough power to make a phone call. And I'd already gotten some pretty good GRE scores. And the next week I was enrolled at NYU in my master's program. Um, They extended the deadline a bit. And so I did this degree, learned about development, and then learned all the information about homes, like people of color in urban areas often live in high-rise buildings and the incidence of asthma and allergies and other pathologies with our health are very, very high. I was like, why is that? And they're like, well, because the ventilation systems are intertwined. So if one person's smoking in apartment 1A, the smoke is wafting up to apartment G, 8G. And if they have a child who has asthma or allergies, that child is then affected. I was like, oh my gosh. You know, and so you you learn about how engineering of buildings in urban areas or engineering of, of ventilation systems can actually affect someone who doesn't even live in the same apartment building or unit. Um, in any case, I realize if my passion is to help people now that I have some means to help people and I love real estate, then I'm going to focus in that way. But guess what? As a woman of color, um, my mentor also said, hey, you're not going to get the loan from the bank to build that high-rise building the right way or, or to build the subdivision the right way. And you need to figure out something that takes your skill set and melds it all together. So he suggested be a, a project manager. And I was like, what's that? And he's like, you're the busy homeowner's best friend. If they're rich, they have a house in Aspen, they have a house in the Hamptons, they have a house in the city, and they're going to want you to help coordinate all the vendors, the the contractors, the cable installation. And I was like, oh, really? There's money in that? He's like, yeah, you get 15% of the project. I was like, oh, well, we made $1.8 million the first year. I was like, that's a lot more than I made in my little desk job wearing my Navy suit. I'll do this. And so after about five to six years of that, you see some of the grays had started to come in. I was like, okay, I can't do this anymore. And so I began to um, do design work for some of those same clients, which was maybe 20 projects a year. Fast forward, brand got licensed, Oprah discovered us, on and on. I mean, it's just an amazing trajectory. And Black Enterprise has been part of that whole journey. Your focus has consistently been on delivering products and design that are eco-friendly, sustainable, and hypoallergenic. Um, Talk us through some of the ways that what you do is different from traditional offerings and what goes into producing products that meet a quote unquote clean standard. (laughs) Well, you know, I'm going to give you, uh, I guess, let me, let me give you the simple things. You know, one of the things we don't think about is our pillow. And I ask everyone when I speak before an audience, when was the last time you washed or replaced your pillow? And most people start groaning, you get grimaces on the face. People are like, uh, college. And I'm like, well, you're 45. Um, (laughs) And so if you think about, and I, not to gross people out, but there's drool, there's dandruff, there's dust, there's pollen, there's any other number of things on your pillow. You might have even taken it on a plane with you or into a foreign hotel room with you. Some people like their pillow. Well, guess what? It now weighs more than when you bought it. So I have a simple rule of threes for pillows. Every three weeks, well, first of all, you're going to have a pillow and the zippered pillow protector on top of that, and then the pillow case. That's number one. So every three weeks, wash that zippered pillow protector. 
Well, every week, of course, do your bed linens. Every three months, wash the actual pillow if you have a down alternative pillow. And every three years, if you haven't done that, replace the pillow. That's a simple thing. The next thing though, of course, is when you have sheets, make sure the sheets that we have at the new line that we're launching at Macy's, which is Clean Design Home X Martex, um, those sheets are woven at a, a three to five, three to five, not three, five, but three to five micron, which means if there's bed bugs or dust mites, they can't really get through the weave very easily. So at least next to where your, your face is, they'll be down below where hopefully your mattress pad is, or they'll stay in the mattress itself. Again, simple tips. Um, if you have uh, towels that are not Sapima cotton or what they call long strand cotton, you've been in a place where you see the dust of the towel flying everywhere. If you're wearing black pants, it gets all over your, your pants. Well, ultimately those little fibers turn into dust Dust causes wheezing and sneezing. And so what you want to try to do is mitigate anything that comes in your home um, that could cause a trigger, a wheeze, a sneeze, um, or, or other things, asthma attacks, which are even um, worse for most people. Is it more <laughs> difficult um, for you to produce products to this standard or even um, to communicate yeah. to the audience at large when you talk about these things because it, it sounds like there's a lot of consumer education that goes along with what you do. Well, that's a, that's a great point. You know, what we do is we have a product that is tested and we have a product that's Okatech certified and we have a product that is um, approved by the various agencies and entities that test our products. Our goal is for the clean design home line to become the go-to line that's affordable, durable, luxury quality for all consumers. I'll use another brand, Carter's. If you have a baby, you know you go to Carter's to get the baby clothes, the little onesies and things like that. You just know it's it's not even advertised. And you go to other brands too, but you everybody knows about Carter's. Our goal is for Clean Design Home to be that brand that you know we've tested the candles, their soy candles, they have a cotton wick. They are in a glass jar that can be reused or a tin that can be reused. So there's a sustainability story there. We have the uh, product, uh, the towels are in a nice pretty ribbon so that we don't necessarily have to package them heavily. We can just stick them in the box um, and not extra plastic and things that, that go into the landfill. Um, we also have glassware and porcelainware. Porcelain, as you know, is fired at a very high level. So it's hospitality quality. I don't want to say the plates are going to bounce or the glassware is going to bounce, but it's the same product that is at the Four Seasons Hotel and, you know, major five, four and five star hotels. They need something that's mega durable that you can actually wash a thousand times and it's not going to fall apart and the glazes aren't going to break down. That's what we're doing. It's trying to make sure if you think about your, your grandmother's, you know, China, it's still there. It didn't break. It wasn't disposable. We're trying to create that mindset again. It's something that's heirloom quality so that at an affordable price, so that you can um, be sustainable in the way that you live. Now, right behind me, this bookcase <laughs> is a good example of sustainability during the COVID pandemic. So um, my daughter had to do remote learning. And I said, you know, I, I don't really have a space. I needed to find and create a space for her. And so this little room that I'm in, I was like, oh, this could be perfect for a library. Well, of course, um, I went to what I call the disposable furniture locations, right? And I found uh, tall bookcases that were a certain price. and. Then I said, wait a second, I'm the sustainability girl. I don't want something I'm going to throw away in a year or two. So I went to an antique shop and you have to ask yourself, how many people buy brown furniture? Nobody. <laughs> right? Right. I a 10 foot long bookcase behind me. I got it for $300. It is nine feet tall, 10 feet long. 
$300 and it's real wood. Now it was scuffed. It was damaged, whatever. I, I went on Dr. Internet, Dr. Google and learned how to sand and stain and whatever. And I painted this bookcase on my own. And then I got my carpenter in one day, but we're all triple maths. And I said, please put this in and here you go. And that is, that's also a sustainable way of living is yeah. buy the brown furniture before it goes into the landfill, repaint it. So you started Robin Wilson Home in 2000 as someone who was one of the pioneers of eco design and has yes. seen great success. Tell us about the business opportunities in the green space. At that time, um, I, I called my business eco friendly. And I continue to do that. Um, I remember doing an interview with a news person, probably in 2005 or six. The person said, you're the green, the green queen. And I was like, uh, okay, I like making money. I didn't know that term. And so um, I, I'd been already now in business by that in five years. Um, and, and going back to our stories, we both have asthma and allergies. I couldn't be on a construction site if it was dusty, unclean, um, if the paints were toxic, you know, that old oil paint where people would just have to run from the room. Um, <laughs> I was like, I can't work on the site. So when Benjamin Moore early on came out with the low to no VOC paints, which I believe Aura was the first one, I became a big proponent because it didn't have any smell. And one hour after you painted it, it was dry. So I was like, we can get our jobs done faster and, you know, more efficient. And I don't have to, you know, have an oxygen mask to come onto the job site. So early on, anything that came to market that was eco-conscious, I was being a big proponent of it. And what that did is it focused consumers in that direction. So the costs came down. And I think that was one of the biggest concerns early in the early days people had was, well, if I do this, yeah, it helps my health, but it's $55, not $35 for a can of paint. Or, and, they, and they were concerned about the cost. And now I think we see supply and demand has made the costs the same pretty much across the board. Even with Kohler, which I, is, a, is a leader in the um, plumbing fixture sector, they created f some of the first low uh, flush toilets. Um, to save water, they, they became proponents of the Water Sense program. You have companies that became big proponents of the Energy Star program for appliance efficiency. Um, and, and so to me, it's, you know, the lexicon of a healthy home should not be an ugly home. And back then, everything was beige, um, more expensive. <laughs> and uh, yes, it had a great story, but I didn't want it. And now you see people have really gone to a different place. They're like, I deserve a pretty home that's eco-conscious, that creates wellness for my family. And especially since this pandemic has occurred and people are working from home, now we want a pillow that's healthy for us. It's not just a pretty pillow. We wanna make sure that, um, that the furniture will last a long time. Um, I think for some of us, our homes were just the place where you drop your keys. Um, and had condiments in the fridge, like my 16 years in New York City. And now I live in the suburbs and now it's it's like, it's a different place. You know, you're, you're home more often um, than, than not. And you want it to feel and reflect who you are. But if you're home more often, we all remember indoor air quality can be five and six times worse. So it's really important to make sure that what you bring in your home, whether it's your, most people don't think about the laser printer. If you have a home office, you need to open that window every once in a while. That laser printer does emit some VOCs. Or you need, if you can't open a window, turn on a fan and get that circulated out of that space because we are doing our home offices as well. So this is a two-sided question. The first is you just talked about um, consumer demand. Do you see consumer demand growing uh, for eco-friendly products? And the flip side of that is as so many more companies, designers, product makers have gotten into that eco-friendly space, how have you continued to differentiate yourself and maintain your competitive advantage? First of all, I believe that everyone deserves a wellness home and environment. 
that's your ecosystem. It's not just eco-friendly. Your ecosystem is your home. It's where you work. It's how you live. It's the exterior of, of your life as well. So if you think about our company, we had a licensing deal for kitchen cabinetry, $82 million wholesale. If you do that in retail numbers, mark it up by five, that's almost half a billion dollars. So that's one of our licenses. But if you think about in general, the more people talk about this, the more it helps all of us. You know, there's some people who want to own the whole pie. And I'm like, there's a whole world that needs to understand that asthma and allergies can really affect your life. Um, if you have one too many asthma attacks, you've scarred your lungs. And, you know, there are, it's like the third or fourth leading cause of death before COVID. And so asthma is really not just a easy disease. You're choking to death. That's the best way to describe it. So if you do have that chronic condition and you don't have a down alternative pillow and you don't have a down alternative comforter, you're causing that wheezing and sneezing. It could be in you or in your child or in an elderly person who needs all the lung capacity they can get with a COVID situation, right? So to me, there's a big marketplace and there's a million products. Our brand though has a goal to be the leader. And if we can make clean design home, be the leader or the go-to, Instead of right now searching everywhere, what's this? What's the best of that? What's the best? You know, we might even create a store very soon, hint, hint, um, that has many, many brands in it. And we're just the clean design home shop. And we have a whole bunch of different brands and we have the best of in that shop. It can help women, um, people of color uh, have a place that they are seeking um, to have their products shown and showcased. We actually have created with Amazon as part of their Black Business Accelerator, a shop called clean, amazon.com forward slash clean design home. And we're prepared to let other vendors join on that platform. They may not have the resources or the staff to handle all of that, but we will put their product on and showcase them. And so we're going to be a, um, a partner. Um, it's been 21 years and, and jokingly that IPO money was spent years ago on the marketing and the branding and, and building it. And we're actually doing a crowd fundraise on the republic.co platform now. And in three days, we've already got over $150,000 committed. Those are the kinds of things that can take us to the next place and build the brand and possibly even go public one day. So you mentioned the licensed uh, kitchen cabinetry. You've also had a licensed line of products at Bed Bath & Beyond. You have an upcoming licensed line of products at Macy's. And I think licensing is one of those areas that's a little bit um, shrouded in mystery. A lot of entrepreneurs don't fully understand it. Um, as someone who is now an expert in the space, can you explain how licensing works and why you chose that approach? Fantastic question. And it will always remain shrouded in mystery. <laughs> There's a shroud. Um, uh, licensing is where a manufacturing partner buys or rents your name or your brand for a period of time. And they take on all of the uh, work such as distribution, um, marketing, um, management of inventory. Uh, they have a sales team that goes out to the various vendors and they, and I'm going to use the term, let's say 80 to 300 people work on my brand for the licensing partner. And I don't have to have that staff. And they go out and they sell that brand around the world. Private label is where I buy product like a glass and I put my brand on it and then I get that product sold, but I then have inventory. 
And being just a solo entrepreneur is where you have product, but you have to sell that product around the world, manage inventory, market it, et cetera. You typically cannot get a license until you have a platform. A platform meaning I've been around 20 years. I'm a pioneer in this space. So as an expert, having written two number one best-selling books, who is on, in the media a lot, who um, can drive sales because of the PR and the marketing and the appearances that I do, a company wants to license my brand because I'm like the walking, talking ambassador. If you are one year into your business, you're not likely going to get a licensing deal unless you're a celebrity because you have the platform of celebrity. However, you can build your business and your brand up as an entrepreneur, become an expert in that niche, and then maybe one day go to private label, which means you find products that you like, you get them sold, and now you have some sales data that you could share with a licensing partner, and then you go into licensing the brand. Um, there can only be so many licensed brands. Let's be clear about that for the simple reason that there's only so many manufacturing companies and they might have between five to 20 licensed partners that they work with on an annual basis. We are running out of time, unfortunately, but before we go, I wanna give you a chance to tell us about these new products that are launching at Macy's next month. Okay. Thank you so much, Black Enterprise, for always supporting my brand and brands. Um, Robin Wilson Home is our legacy brand. I don't want to say it's being retired, but it sort of is. Um, <laughs> we uh, will keep Robin Wilson Home on the design side. And we've now launched a new brand. We're partnered with uh, Martex, which is a company owned by Carl Icahn. And we have a line of towel sheets, comforters, protectors for mattresses and pillows, robes, everything for bed and bath. Let's put it that way. It's a beautiful little package. You can see the ribbon around it, nice logo. Um, I think there's a glare, but I'll say this much. It's Sapima cotton. It is exquisite. And um, we are going to be in 165 Macy stores as of January 2nd, 2022. And um, in Hawaii, Guam, and Puerto Rico. Please walk in there. Prove that our brand a brand uh, created by a woman of color can sell. Um, I think it's time to remember that old adage that I said earlier. My grandfather was a sharecropper and he picked cotton. Now I am realizing his dream of being an entrepreneur and my products are made of cotton. It's time to support the ancestral origin stories and really take it to the next level. Thank you so much, Robin, for sharing your small business success story. Everyone out there, please take a look at the company website, robinwilsonhome.com. You can also follow them on Facebook and Instagram at Robin Wilson Home. Check out the podcast channel on blackenterprise.com to find Sister Zinc and more podcasts from Black Enterprise writers, editors, and experts. Be sure to subscribe to Sisters Inc. on SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. And if you like what you hear, show us some love by leaving a five-star review or put a sister on by spreading the word. This is Elisa Gums with Sisters Inc. for Black Enterprise. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.